Greetings programs! I have three and a half pages of notes about Tron, so let's get started. Welcome back to Every Disney Movie Ever. My name is Jess and I'm watching Every Disney Movie Ever. Today I'm going to talk about Tron. Tron is a 1982 theatrical release. It's written and directed by Steven Lisberger, cinematography by Bruce Lowy, and the editing by Jeff Gorson, and the music's by Wendy Carlos. Steven Lisberger is best known for this. Hot Pursuit and Animal Olympics. Bruce Logan is actually better known for his visual effects work on films such as Star Wars Episode 4 and 2001 A Space Odyssey. Jeff Gorson is best known for every Adam Sandler movie. I'm pretty sure he's just Adam Sandler's editor. Wendy Carlos is best known for this and The Shining. The film stars Jeff Bridges, Bruce Boxleitner, David Warner, and Cindy Morgan. Jeff Bridges plays Kevin Flynn, and he's best known for The Big Lebowski, True Grit, Crazy Heart, and Hell or High Water. Bruce Boxleitner plays Alan and Tron, and he's best known for for Babylon 5, 1 and 2, and Tron 1 and 2. David Warner plays Dillinger, Sark, and the MCP, and he's best known for Star Trek 6, Titanic, Time After Time, and this. Cindy Morgan plays Laura and Yori, and she's best known for Caddyshack, Galaxus, Chips, and Tron. Development for Tron began in 1976 when Steven Lisberger saw a game of Pong. He became so fascinated with it and the world of video games, he wanted to explore that world in a film, and he created the Tron character. He had his own little studio, Lisberger Studios. It was an animation studio. They did Animal Olympics. And they decided they wanted to make this Tron movie with backlit cell animation, which is a very lengthy, complicated process, but they wanted it to be a completely animated film. So they started trying to get private backing, and they received about four to five million dollars with private backing, but they needed more money. So they created this 30 second little teaser of the animation and what they intended to do to sell them and the studio and they shopped it around and people were impressed but not willing to invest in that project and they finally approached disney who they thought were the definition of tradition and would want nothing to do with this project but disney at the time was struggling and was looking for experimental products and they created Tron. It became a live action decision and before they just gave Steven Lisberger $10 million to make the movie because he was a first time director, they made him do a test and he did a test and they made the person's suit glow and Disney was very impressed so they agreed that the film could be made. The original test was 35 millimeters and Disney loved it so much they decided the film was going to be shot in 65 millimeter Super Panavision. The film was shot in black and white, for those of you who don't know, in order to get the colored neon look they had, it had to be shot in black and white against an all black set with white tape marking out the parts of the set that were going to glow, and then the actors wore all white spandex with black circuitry all over them showing where they were going to glow. Backlit cell animation is a very complicated process where you have to go over each individual frame at least four times with different negatives and different layouts in order to make each part of the scene glow. It's a very complicated process. This is the first, one of the first films to use computer animation extensively and that's, there's only 15 to 20 minutes of pure computer animation in the film. But it was so important that Disney had four different computer graphics firms across the country working on different scenes in the film. The computers at the time had two megabytes of memory and 330 megabytes of storage. The computers also couldn't run animation, so they had to animate each individual frame at a time. And there was no way to put it onto film either. So the camera had to capture each individual frame on the computer screen. It was a very complicated process. John Lasseter said without Tron, there would be no Toy Story. That's how amazing Tron was and how big of a deal it was in the technological advancement of film. The film was supposed to be released on Christmas Day, but when Disney executives found out that Don Bluth was going to be releasing The Secret of Nim in July, they decided to bump the movie up to be released in July, and Tron ended up competing with Star Trek II, E.T., Blade Runner, and The Poltergeist. The film cost $17 million to make and it made $33 million in the box office, so it didn't do the greatest. But Roger Ebert loved it. He gave it four out of four stars. A lot of other people enjoyed it. Variety didn't so much enjoy it. It did get nominated for two Academy Awards costumes and sound, but it didn't get nominated for effects. And a lot of people put up a stink about that. The Academy didn't nominate 
Tron for effects because they thought they cheated using the computer. They did, however, 14 years later, get an Academy Award for technological advancement. The film was novelized by Brian Daly and there were VHS releases in 83 and all throughout the 90s, a DVD release in 98 in 2002 and a Blu-ray release in 2011. It does have sequels, a TV show called Tron Uprising and a sequel to this film called Tron Legacy released in 2010 that I will obviously get to eventually, but we're still in 1982, so let's not get ahead of ourselves. Uh, the arcade games based off the movie outgrossed the film. There were also arcade games on set to help the actors get into the zone and really feel what they were doing, and Jeff Bridges had to often be peeled away from the games in order to shoot a scene. They'd be like, come on, Jeff, and he'd be like, oh, hang on a second, hang on, I'm almost done. Uh, Jeff Bridges also had to wear a dance belt because he created too big of a situation in his spandex. He also has that toga wrap gladiator thing that hangs in front of there. Uh, the majority of the film. I'm pretty sure he never has that off of him. So there was obviously something going on <laughs> in his spandex. For those of you wondering, I have seen this film before. I love Tron. It's been a staple in my household since I was little. It really takes place in the 80s. It feels like the 80s. I realize it's the first Disney film to feel like the 80s because the last few they've done have been period pieces. They've taken place a couple years before the 80s or in the medieval times. <laughs> so it was the first film to really take place present day in the 80s at Disney and it feels like it and it's really exciting. I'm very excited for the 80s if you can't tell. There are a couple map paintings in the film and for those of you who don't know what a map painting is, it's when you have a shot and you like the shot but you really want it to seem like more grandiose or you don't like part of the background so you take a piece of glass and you paint over it what you really want to, the background to be or pieces of the shot to be and you place it over the original shot and you get the shot you actually want and it blends seamlessly. Alfred Hitchcock did this a lot, especially in The Birds. This movie has a couple matte paintings. There's only one that I know of and it, while I was watching I was like, I bet this is the matte painting because the background is so grandiose and ridiculous in the live action world, not in the computer generated world. It's computer generated, you can do whatever you want on the computer. So. I then watched the bonus features, which I will talk about later, and it is the map painting and they show it before and after and I thought that was really cool. So I wanted to show that for you guys. The lighting in the live action, like in the real world sequences, the whole movie's live action, but in the real world sequences, when you're not in the computer, when you're not in the program with the MCP, when you're, you know, at Flynn's or in NCOM, the cinematography is absolutely stunning. And I just wanted to say that because the scene in particular that I'm talking about is when Alan, Kevin, and Lori, Laura, <laughs> Lori, it's mixing their names. Laura are all talking about Flynn breaking into NCOM and that lighting in that scene is so good. There are a few funny things I wanted to point out. The first being Alan says Flynn is a little bit like Santa Claus when they get inside NCOM. And then later when Flynn is typing in a password, his password is reindeer flotilla. So he is indeed a little bit like Santa Claus. Um, in Sark's main headquarters, there is a Pac-Man Easter egg he, and you can even hear him. Sark goes on to hit someone and when that person like goes down and derezzes or gets hurt, Pac-Man goes wah, 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 like he died. So I thought that was really interesting. And then I read that there was a hidden Mickey and I was like, oh, okay, like I'll try to keep an eye out for it. And then it's not like some hidden Mickey down in the corner. It takes up the entire screen and how I never noticed the Mickey Mouse before knowing that there was one. I mean, I didn't know where it was going to be, but because I was being so adamant about trying to find it, I saw it and now I'm wondering how I never in my life saw the hidden Mickey before because it's not just like three circles and you're like, oh, ha ha, a hidden Mickey. No, it's Mickey Mouse's head like from the side. So it's like full on his ears. The I want to, you can see it. And I was just like, I was trying so hard to like potentially see like three circles together in like a canyon and then it's Mickey's whole head <laughs> takes up the entire screen. It was ridiculous. I thought the resolution in the program world was really well done. You got to see everything light up blue and everyone was all excited that they were free again. And I felt that resolution was really great and satisfying. And then the resolution in the real world is cut so short. It's like Flynn gets the evidence he wanted and then we see him flying in on a helicopter, meeting his friends and hugging them. And that's like 
he became CEO, that's the resolution. And I was hoping just like for a little bit more of a real world resolution, even though I've seen the movie so many times, just watching it with an analytical eye, I realized that the real world doesn't get as awesome and as lengthy of a resolution as the program world does, which makes sense because you're in the program world a lot more than you are in the real world in the film. But still, I would have really enjoyed a little bit more of a resolution seeing, you know, Dillinger get his comeuppance, which you do. You get to see him like fall and realize that he's totally screwed. But I would have loved to have seen Flynn, I don't know, something a little bit more with Flynn and Laura and Alan. I do love, however, that Alan and Flynn don't really fight over Laura. Laura obviously dated Flynn. It's like a big thing. And at the beginning, Alan's making some big stink about going to see Flynn. But then once he realizes like Flynn's a good guy and Dillinger sucks, <laughs> he's on his side and they all work together and everything. And then like he's seen hugging them at the end and he's never fighting Alan for Laura. He's very like, oh, she's still leaving her clothes all over the floor. Like he makes a comment like that. And like, you know, he, he might seem a little salty and everything, but at the end they're friends and they're hugging and Laura and Alan are still together and there was no situation between the three of them. However, Yori cheats on Tron for a real one by kissing Flynn in the program. But that's not Laura. Laura is not Yori. Yori's acting up her own accord. She's a program. So I can't blame Laura for that. Laura didn't do it. But Yori cheats on Tron, so I feel real bad for Tron. But Alan and Laura are going strong, so I loved that. I love that they never like thought about the girl. That was just so great. They just focused on the freaking problem and didn't create a love triangle, even though it was so obvious that maybe that was supposed to happen. But all in all, I really love the movie, obviously. But I'm not done talking about it because I have the DVD. And it's the two disc special edition DVD, which means there were a ton of bonus features. There are over two hours of special features on this DVD and I watched all of it just for you. A bunch of it went into depth about the backlit cell animation and the computer graphics animation, both of which I don't fully comprehend and I don't wanna butcher them for you. So if you wanna learn more about those processes, I highly encourage you to look them up and read about them because I don't understand a lot of it. All I know about the backlit cell animation is what I said before, is where they take each individual frame and do at least four passes at different negatives in order to get each individual part of the frame that they wanna glow or not glow like the face. And then they composite it all together for each individual frame, at least four different. A lot of the time it could be like, you know, 10, which is crazy and I can't even understand or comprehend. There is an hour and a half documentary and then special features about the making of Tron. A lot of it was stuff I have already told you, but some of it was interesting because they had the actors talking and they had everyone that worked on the film talking about it. Not everyone. I'm pretty sure that'd be like 500 people, but the big names working on the film talking about it too. And I want to talk about casting a little bit. Jeff Bridges got the script and thought it was very, very cool and like a cool risk to take. So he hopped on. Bruce Boxleitner, however, had no interest because he was a big cowboy dude. So he originally started reading the script and was like, I don't understand any of this. No, thank you. Send it away. And then Lisberger and Disney reached out again and was like, please, can you just like come in and we'll show you some storyboards and kind of what we our ideas. And Bruce said, fine, okay. And he came in and they showed him everything and he thought it was really interesting. And then he found out Jeff Bridges had signed on and he said, okay, I'll do it. And I thought that was really, really cool. Also, in the original film, you can see different glitches in the coloring. So like they might get really bright or they might dim. And they just added a sound effect to that, but that actually wasn't supposed to happen. They realized that was happening because they were using the film, the actual film from film reels out of order because film always is a little bit, um, What's the word I'm looking for? Not great, sometimes it's a little bit broken. What is the word I'm looking for? I don't know what word I'm looking for, but sometimes it, it imperf it's imperfect. It doesn't, It's not all of it is perfect. They're all a little bit different. So you have to use them in order so you won't really notice the differences. But if you just use the film in random different orders, you might notice like, oh, this is a little bit brighter, this is a little bit darker, etc. So, once they realized that, they started putting the film in the correct order, but toward the beginning of different, or in different scenes, there will be glitches. It's fixed now. In my DVD, there are no glitches. No glitches, they don't exist. 
um, because they have fixed them. But back then, the glitches did exist, so they decided instead of like having a conniption, they'd keep it in and they would add little sound effects to make it sound like the computer was glitching because computers glitch all the time. I thought that was so interesting. There were also some deleted scenes in the special features, which I thought was really cool because I, I never really gave the thought that Tron had deleted scenes, but they do. They have three deleted scenes. One is a, they call it the love scene between Yori and Tron. They go to Yori's quarters and it's like all neon and fancy and she changes into this beautiful outfit and she's all like lovey-dovey on Tron and everything. And Steven Lisberger regrets taking it out of the film. Harrison Ellenshaw, the visual effects supervisor, really wanted it to stay in the film and they fought so hard about it and Lisberger says he regrets taking it out. I disagree. I think the film is better without that scene. I think it's completely un- not unmotivated, I guess, because Tron and Yori are a thing, because Alan and Laura are a thing, but it's still just- I think it takes away from the film, and I'm glad it's not in there, but Lisberger and Ellen Shaw both thought it was such a special moment and that it should have stayed. I disagree. The second deleted scene kind of goes hand in hand with the first deleted scene. It's- they call it the morning after, it's just- Tron sitting the next day, supposedly, but it's a program world, so there's no sun or anything, so you don't really know when a day is. And uh, Yori comes out and just like kind of hugs him, and that's that deleted scene. The third deleted scene is actually an alternate opening. It's not a deleted scene, it's an alternate opening in which no one speaks. You just get to read what like the Tron program or the program world is, instead of the speaking at the beginning of the film. Also, throughout the entire special features, there were so many cool behind the scenes pictures and storyboards and just stuff I got to see. I took some screenshots so I could put them up here. I just thought all of that stuff was really, really cool. So if you ever get to see this DVD or a different special feature situation, I highly encourage you to watch it, even if you have no interest in like the animation aspect. The storyboards and the test footage and just the behind the scenes pictures are so worth it. It's really, really cool. That is everything I have on Tron. I'm not going to give it a 10 because I don't think it is a 10, but I do love it a lot. It's very nostalgic. It holds a very special place in my heart. Jeff Bridges is fine in this movie. So I think I'll give it eight programs out of 10. Our total movie count is... Parents at Soul and Cry Counter are the same. If you want to keep up with what movie I'm watching when, follow me on Instagram or Twitter and you'll find out what movie I'm watching when. I put up videos every Monday and Friday. Until next time, comment, like, subscribe, but I'm not charge live. You are, so you do you, and don't be the MCP about it. That was a task. I feel like I've been doing that for like an hour and a half.